Welcome, 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 welcome. It's a full house. We do have... Uh, Hank was pointing at somebody. Oh, my wife? Yeah, my wife is here. Uh, <laughs> uh, this is about as full a panel as we have had. Uh, I'm excited that you're here. I'm, I'm really appreciative, and I express my welcome on behalf of my wife, on behalf of our board. I know that uh, Drew Davis, another one of the members of the foundation board, is here as well, so I extend the welcome on his behalf. Uh, this is an exciting event. It is being simulcast on the internet, so those joining us through the internet, uh, we welcome you. It will post on our website ultimately, so those who watch this in time later on, we welcome you as well. We are uh, a, a Christian-based uh, ministry here, so we begin with a word of prayer, if you will pray with me. Um, our Lord, we pause before you to say thank you for our working brains. Thank you for this true life that we live as image bearers of you. And Father, thank you for our panelists today to discuss this salient and important question. We pray that you will give us wisdom, insight, alertness, discernment, appreciation, and respect for you as we approach and listen today. We pray all these things in your holy name. For your sake, we live. Amen. So, let me start by introducing the panelists, and I'll start with Gretchen Huzinga over here. And Gretchen is someone that I hope you'll get a chance to meet. I hope you can meet all of these people when this is over. We last for an hour and a half. We have a lot of young people in here. And while I will never be this young again, I'm also older than I've ever been before. <laughs> And I will tell you, young people, that some of those who are not as young as you will be glad to know this only lasts an hour and a half, and then you can go to the restrooms. Um, but uh, uh, we do last for an hour and a half. If you need to get up and leave, just be as careful as you can and honor these folks who, who would love to visit afterwards, but may be limited in how long they can. So we have the researcher, writer, and speaker, Gretchen um, Huzinga here. Uh, she has her master's degree from the University of Washington. She has her PhD from the University of Washington on artificial intelligence ethics and Christianity. She's a research fellow at AI and Faith, exploring how the world's faiths can shed some light on the moral, ethical challenges of artificial intelligence. She has been a podcast host for Microsoft research. Uh, she has been a podcast host of being human in an age of AI. And I don't think I'm being unfair when I say that she's recognized as a world-class expert on matters pertaining to artificial intelligence and ethics. So would you join me in a Texas welcome to Gretchen. Now, I'm going to flip sides of the table, and we're going to work our way in. This is Andy Steiger. Andy is the founder and the president of Apologetics Canada Ministries. He takes complex theological and philosophical ideas, and he puts those on a shelf so everyone can understand them. He's got his Ph.D., from the University of Aberdeen. It's in Scotland. It's basically the Texas Tech of Scotland. It's really a <laughs> top-notch institution. He's been a pastor for 20 years. He's written substantially, but I think his most recent book is Reclaimed, How Jesus Restores Our Humanity in a Dehumanized World. Lives in Abbotsford, British Columbia, has a wife, two boys, and they love being outdoors among the beautiful lakes and mountains of British Columbia. So can you 
let him know how Texas welcomes the Canadians in our midst. <laughs> Thanks. Now, immediately to Andy's left is Gary Habermas. And many of you will have read a lot of his books. He's the distinguished research professor of apologetics. He's the chair of the Department of Philosophy at Liberty University in Lynchburg, Virginia. He's a, yes, basically the Texas Tech of Lynchburg, Virginia. <laughs> He's a New Testament scholar and theologian. He writes prolifically, especially on the resurrection of Jesus, some of the most uh, um, seminal, thorough books you will find on the resurrection of Jesus. He got his PhD in Michigan State University. Uh, go Sparty or whatever we say about that. It, it is the Texas Tech of Michigan. He is right. <laughs> From his lips. He's written and edited more than 20 books. I think we've got all of them in the library. If we don't, we will by next Wednesday. <laughs> Many of the books have been about the resurrection of Jesus, making the case that it really happened. He's also written, though, on other aspects of the historical Jesus. He's worked on, written on finding purpose through pain. Uh, at the risk of just being transparent, I believe your first wife passed away. Uh, and uh, from cancer and he so he when he writes on finding God's purpose through pain uh, he's been through the school that educates you in that regard and has every right to write on it but you'll want to quiz him about C.S. Lewis he's quite the Lewis guy um, you're also he's written on the Shroud of Turin and uh, so yeah, get ready for that one and, and talk to him about that, though that was a long time ago. So it'll be a good memory test for him. He's married to Eileen, who's with us today. Eileen, where are you? Uh, 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 there you are. Wave your hand. There, the, the lovely Eileen, and we thank you for being here. They live in Lynchburg, Virginia. Can you welcome them to Houston, Texas, please? And at the end of my introductions is my good friend, John Lennox. We have tried to get John here for um, uh, some time, and we are finally successful, and we are so delighted. He is our friend from Oxford University. He has more degrees than a thermometer. He's got... <laughs> An MA degree, a master's in math, a PhD, all from Cambridge University, the Oxford of the River Cam. <laughs> um, and Oxford, of course, being the Texas Tech of Oxford. <laughs> um, he's got an MA and a DPhil, also from Oxford University, by incorporation of sorts. He's got a master's degree in bioethics from the University of Surrey. He's gotten honors that uh, um, would uh, uh, just flabbergast you if you were familiar with these continental honors. Uh, a Humboldt fellow, University of Würzburg, Freiburg. He taught mathematics, uh, including at the University of Wales in Cardiff. He's written a boatload of books, and, and his books are amazing on so many different levels. The, the last one that... Well, actually, I've read your AI book now, but the one before that that I read was your business ethics of sort book, um, uh, which was wonderful. He's got Seven Days That Divide the World, which I heartily recommend to people. Um, he's got uh, over 70 published mathematical papers, which I don't recommend to people. <laughs> Amen. I believe he is... Um, if, if we were just introducing him as a mathematics professor, um, you would see why when he speaks on mathematics, he has wall-to-wall -wall standing room only audiences. He's one of the best mathematic, mathematicians that the UK produced in the 20th century. And he holds just about every mathematics honor there is. In other words, he's like really bright. 
and we are so thrilled to finally get him here to our campus. So would you join me in welcoming Dr. John Lennox? Okay, let's get this started. Uh, since I introduced you last, Dr. Lennox, and we are biblical people who understand the last will be first, and the first will be last, I'll start questioning with you. What is artificial intelligence? Artificial intelligence comes in two sorts, narrow AI and general AI. A narrow AI system is typically a system consisting of a powerful computer, a large database, and an algorithm that picks things out from the database. A typical example is where the database would be, say, a collection of a million x-rays of human lungs. They're labeled with the diseases that they represent. And an x-ray is taken of your lungs and the AI system compares the X-ray of your lungs with a million very rapidly, and it spits out a diagnosis. And these days, that will be better than you get at your local hospital. But you need to realize that as one of the early pioneers in AI, who's from Alabama and a Christian, Joseph Ray Millichamp, he wrote a paper long ago that says something very important. He said, the artificial in artificial intelligence is real. In other words, it really is artificial. So it's not real intelligence. And an AI narrow system does typically one single thing that normally requires human intelligence. So it's simulating human intelligence. It is not itself intelligent. Artificial general intelligence is the uh, subject of a lot of hi-fi and speculation, but there are serious scientists who are interested in it, and that's the idea of producing a super intelligence, either by enhancing existing humans or else getting rid of biological dependence on materials that perish and starting from scratch and building some kind of superintelligence on a base like silicon. The speculation's all there, the fascination's all there, and there are lots of questions about it, but they're very separate because narrow AI is working, it's doing some wonderful things, it has massive ethical problems. AGI, we're nowhere near there yet, but we're near enough for fears to be realized about it. All right, uh, in that regard, I'm sure all of us watched at least two or three times the Mission Impossible um, movie that came out this summer, Dead Reckoning. Am I the only one who watched that? Hmm? Okay, good, good. That was, uh, uh, did y'all watch that? No? You did not see it? Well, that's okay, it just pretty much explains the whole panel. Um, <laughs> It dealt with general AI that's taking over the yeah. world unless Tom Cruise can save the world. And we won't find out for sure if he saves the world until next summer when part two comes out. <laughs> but um, he's got the key to saving the world if he can figure out how to do it now. Um, narrow AI and general AI. We're going to keep that dialogue and those distinctions present. Narrow AI. Uh, Chat GPT. Um, Chat GPT took a law exam at the University of Michigan Law School. It's a top 10 law school in the country. Law exams are graded anonymously. So the professor does not know who wrote which exam. And Chat GPT got a B plus which is pretty good, especially at the University of Michigan Law School. But somewhere in here, not with maybe narrow AI, but more with general AI, we have a question of whether or not artificial intelligence is becoming 
a human thinking. So I'm going to take a step back, and Gary, I'm going to ask you, what makes a human a human? No, I wonder why I was invited today. <laughs> uh, I think primarily from Scripture, a human is a person who's made in God's image, and God is the ultimate creator and let's say father of humans everywhere and who we are is who God says we are he's the judge I tell people I don't answer questions like XYZ on who's there and who isn't because I don't separate the wheat from the tares I don't separate the goats from the sheep uh, that's God's business so ultimately we live our lives as we think God has called us to he's our maker creator we owe him he's the father of ethics he's the father of epistemology, ontology, all the big words of philosophy and science. He's a father of all of us, and we are as we achieve according to our understanding of what he requires, and of course, he's the final judge. Okay. Thank you, Miss Carolyn. Um, so, Gretchen, where, where does this become an ethical issue? Where is there potential for dehumanizing a human? Explain to us the, the concerns that, that arise in your mind, please. Yeah. Ultimately, the idea behind AI is that everything is computationally reducible. The original gangsters of AI in Dartmouth in 1956 made the claim when they were trying to get some funding and traction in AI that everything could be so precisely described in intelligence that a machine could be made to simulate it. So I would anchor any of the ethical conversation based on your presuppositions. What's your worldview? And that's sort of where my work is hovering right now. I want to mention, Mark said that an AI took the law exam. To date, I've never seen it win a case in court, right? So that's a differentiator. And I think that's a, an interesting thing. Would it be fair? ethically if you were judged by an AI. And there's a lot of conversation about that right now. It's like, is it right to, for an AI to make a decision that affects your life? So that's a huge ethical question. A lot of the research that's going on in AI ethics is, is revolving around bias and fairness and transparency. And you know, a lot of it is uh, political in its outcomes. It's, it's sociological, it's anthropological. And I think we need to, investigate the theological questions as well. Um, and, and Gary was talking a little bit about what, what makes us human. I would say the other thing ethically that we should think about is whether an AI can do all the cognitive stuff that we can do, does it have a soul? And I would say the breath of God that we read about in Genesis has never been breathed into a machine. If the grid goes down, there is no AI, right? Um, so we need to actually consider what kinds of questions we're, we're asking of AI. And I'll just kind of close on this, Mark. Um, the work that's coming out of the science right now on AI is, is presupposing that AI can be human. And I'd say that's our core ethical question. We need to challenge that as Christians to say, because we can talk about all of the other stuff all day long and, and how many angels dance on the head of a pin. But I think we need to go to the, the root of the cause and what is AI compared to humans ethically. So I served on a panel and uh, dealing with this issue at NYU Law School. And the, the, the issue is, as we had prepared it and, and dialogued on it was whether or not AI is appropriate to use in a sentencing case with criminals. The idea being that judges are given criteria by which someone should be sentenced, but within those sentencing guidelines, the judge has great discretion. And there's a substantial corpus of literature and s studies in the legal field that illustrate that certain races seem to be disproportionately sentenced compared to other races, that certain um, not just ethnicities, but certain socio groups, socioeconomic groups, are disproportionately harshly sentenced 
In other words, the rich get off easier than the poor. And sometimes it's blamed upon a judge who's arbitrary. And so the argument was being made that we should let AI do the sentencing because it would be more fair than a human. And I, 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 the time I spent on that commission and committee was, was interesting, but it raises this question. And so, Andy, I want to take it to you, and, and I want you to frame your response and your thought to what we've heard thus far within this framework of, of what is artificial dignity and, and what, what are concerns with machines that seem to be better humans than we are? Yeah, that's a great question. To maybe just even to back up a little bit about the, the conversation that we're in with regards to even what it means to be human from maybe more of a philosophical perspective, that we would say that there's a, di there's a, di a distinction between the parts that a thing is made of versus the purposeful whole that a thing is made for. And we live in a culture that's very reductive that wants to look at the parts and not the whole. And that set, tends to frame a lot of our conversations around AI and how we're seeing it. For example, uh, when we're talking about this difference between narrow or weak AI and strong AI, where this idea that strong AI is where, you know, we're talking about a machine that now becomes human, this, is, this has been framed by uh, Alan Turing, particularly with the imitation game or the Turing test. And what's important just to appreciate about that is that it's very reductive in that it views a human uh, according to human behavior. So it's, it's just a, d a type of behaviorism that if we can imitate, uh, emulate the behavior, then it is that thing. And this is all predicated on a, on a deception about whether or not this machine is successful at pretending to be human. And where all this comes into this question, that's what I just wanted to back up a little bit, is when we're now talking about artificial dignity, see, we have documents like the Universal Declaration of Human Rights that says that all human beings have inherent dignity. Inherent means you were born with it, nobody gave it to you, you came into the world with it. It's encountered, not created. However, if you start to buy into the AI ontology of what it means to be human, that, that starts to go out the window because now, given certain behaviors, a machine can qualify for humanity. But we have to appreciate if you can qualify for it, you can unqualify for it. And that then becomes problematic where dignity no longer is inherent. It now has to meet a certain type of criteria. So what can be applied to the machine can be applied to the human. And this now becomes that artificial dignity where you're trying to earn it. So if, if I'm understanding you right, you, you've got a concern that if a properly programmed and manufactured computer with artificial intelligence arises to the level of human dignity, then we run the risk of the same thinking process determining that certain people are defectively programmed and not worthy of that type of dignity. Is that fair? Yeah, so if you set a criteria that a machine has to reach to qualify for human, well, we have humans that can't qualify then. So now we give up our dignity. Okay, so one of, one of so I, I have a, you do not realize this. We do not practice this. They have no clue what I'm going to be asking them. They gave me a list of things they'd like me to ask them. I don't care. <laughs> I get to do whatever I wish. And so I will take speaker's liberty and I'm going to announce a pet peeve of mine and a project of mine and a soapbox on which I stand and then I want to use it to pepper you for with some questions about it. Here it is. I was addressing Palm Beach Atlantic's graduate chapel on the issue of AI. And I implored them to develop 
a curriculum or some type of discipline of a theology of science that says that science, from a Christian perspective, I believe, science is a tool that God has given us to combat the evils of this world and the consequences of the fall. And like every gift of God, it can be maligned and abused to make it destructive. The same understanding of the atom that allows us to do an MRI and early diagnose cancer is the same understanding about the atom that allows us to use an atom bomb or a dirty bomb. And I'm absolutely convinced that Christians must not only develop a theology of science that is rich, but then we need to be the leaders because we can infuse theology or we can infuse science with ethics that absent Christian or Judeo-Christian understanding, science can never produce on its own. Science can't come up with ethics. It only comes from humanity. And I would argue that part of being a human is understanding the ethical thumbprint that God has put upon us. And I don't see how a machine can ever do that. And that's a big distinction. So now that I'm off my soap, <laughs> um, I want to know where you folks, you know, me just even saying that, what does it drive in you in reaction? The panel's yours. The floor's yours. Amen. <laughs> I'll be more direct. Do you believe as Christians we should be involved in AI research and we should be chasing it down and pursuing it? Yes, I do because I think that we need, for the reasons you've expressed, people that are competent scientifically to stand and show that they really can do this research, but that they can develop ethics at the same time. And there's some wonderful Christians here in this country doing it. Ros Pickard is one of them in MIT. She's developed a whole field of AI called affective computing and has developed a smartwatch that can predict a seizure, and she's saving people's lives. There's lots of stuff that can be done like that, and I encourage actively young people who are scientifically gifted to go into it. I use a slightly different metaphor from you, in the sense that all technology, I say, is like a knife. A good knife, you can use it for surgery, or you can use it for murder. And the point is, and it's been floating around and what's being said is, that if we want to talk about ethics that are internal to an AI, that must be programmed by human beings. And that's where the huge problem is. Whose ethics? For centuries, the basic ethic in the West has been the Judeo-Christian. We've lost that. And that is a, a massive problem. If I could just make one point, Mark, about what you were saying earlier. I think that we should recall that this idea that AI is turning into humans runs up again a colossal barrier, and it's this. God has created humans in a very interesting way in that he has linked intelligence with consciousness. Machines are not conscious. In fact, we have no idea what consciousness is. And the idea that we're going to make consciousness is, is simply a pipe dream. So that we need to be very realistic here. We're talking about things. I have quizzed some of the leading researchers on mind and body in the world. They don't know what consciousness is. So we cannot yet talk of anything like what we know a normal human being to be. Now, as a mathematician, one final point is a machine in a technical sense, and the whole basis of AI is to develop machines that can do all these things. But machines can be simulated by an abstract concept called a Turing machine. And if Roger Penrose, one of the brightest mathematicians of this century in Oxford, is right, 
He says the human mind as it is can do things in mathematics that cannot be done by a machine, no matter how complex it is. And that means there's a, an impossible gap between the notion of a machine that can think or be moral and a human being. So uh, that's my short take on it. I'm very skeptical about a lot of the hype that surrounds this. Go. Um, there's this idea of moral agency in AI, and it's whether a machine can make a decision like a human. It, I'll just say, spoiler alert, no, it can't. Um, the theology of AI has to begin with the fact that humans have been given the mind of Christ. Christians, spiritually alive, Christians have been given the mind of Christ. A machine will never have that. And the other thing, uh, Mark, based on kind of your judgment thing, one of the big um, beauties of Christ is mercy. And that's the, the entire gospel in itself is that, you know, God made him who knew no sin to be sin so that we could have the righteousness of Christ. A machine will never do that. A machine calculates data. And, and when you talk about the, the disparities, it's, it's not because the machine is racist. It's just because it's reflecting the entire corpus of human decisions and human data and saying this statistically is what's going to happen. We don't like that, but it is statistically true, right? And so whether it was unfairly true or not is irrespective to the machine. And so when you get back to the moral agency, that's I think another key thing we have to look at is what does an agent do, an autonomous agent? Do we want to give it the power to do that? And that is where the bus is being driven right now because it takes, we're outsourcing morality to machines because it's difficult, you know? We, we feel ethical tension. Uh, should I do this or shouldn't I? And the Bible may not say exactly what you should do and you have to wrestle. And sometimes it's to personal detriment. Like if I make a decision as an AI scientist that will make me more money and get me you know, academic kudos, I want that. And if I, but then I might be harming people. So can I, do I believe in God and his promises enough to say, I'm not gonna do that. And I think that's, again, taking it way upstream, so. That's great. Um, yeah. So, Gary, you're making notes, which makes me say, what are you thinking? <laughs> That's a good way to put it. Uh, we've been talking a lot about ethics and what machines can and can't do. I would add another component. Machines are mindless. Um, they don't think in the true sense. It's already been mentioned. But in the Judeo-Christian heritage, soul means life. Spirit is the immaterial portion of men and women. And, well, a, a new book just came out from Discovery Press, the ID people in Seattle, it's called Minding the Brain. It was just published a couple weeks ago with the top philosophers and scientists saying, what are arguments for dualism and for bringing that back into philosophy and so on, where humans have minds, humans live forever, humans have, that's tied to ethics too. But I'm thinking of an experiment done, another name from that uh, John mentioned back from the good old days, Penfield said in a series of experiments years ago, he was working on some epileptic patients and he would stimulate their brain while they were conscious and he would say, oh, you just moved your left leg. And the patient said, no you moved my left leg by stimulating the brain. And Penfield started thinking about this and seeing what this took to say that we are minded individuals. And he ended the book by changing from a monistic kind of approach to a dualistic kind of approach. And today this is pretty common, but he ended the book saying, because of my thinking about this, and no, I didn't move my hand, my finger, you did, by stimulating it, and I know the difference. He said, I'm now a dualist, and I'm even, in, I'm even open to the concept of afterlife. So I think those kinds of things about spirit go along with ethics. Two things now, 
that machines will never have, and, and we can't reach human, human uh, persons without those. Great point, and Andy, I want to come to you, but John's dying to jump in yes, right he here. Is. <laughs> I want to go back to something that Andy said, that we have been so dominated in the academy by reductionism Everything is reducible to physics and chemistry. The Rembrandt painting is just a collection of molecules. But Gary is touching on something hugely important. It used to be much more controversial than it is now. And that is the basic stuff, if I may use a crude expression, in the universe is not matter and energy. And I'm going to tell you a very short story. I was in a major conference on the what is the basic stuff? And the idea is, as you use the words, it's a monism. There's only one kind of stuff, and there are epiphenomena on top of that, and that's mind. And I waited for quite a long time. And then I put up my hand to make a statement, and I said three words. I said, God is spirit. And there was dead silence, and the person speaking, I'll not tell you the name, world famous in this area, she lost her temper and said, my philosophy cannot cope with that. And she got up and walked out in a conference in Oxford. And the idea was that we forget that God is primary. Mass energy is derivative. The basic philosophy of materialism, naturalism is the other way round. Mass, energy are primary, mind is derivative, and the idea of God is derivative because there is no God. And that's where the tension is in our culture. And it's reflected in AI studies and all the rest of it. So I, I think that's what we've got to fight against and stand up for the fact that the ultimate reality in the universe is God who is spirit. We've got to turn it upside down. Okay, Andy. Uh, yeah, I completely agree. And one of the things that I'm seeing that's taking place that con concerns me, because I, I am very, I'm always optimistic. I think AI and technology can be used for great good. And the challenge, of course, is that, as was mentioned, is that technology can be used for great evil. And one of the questions that I'm seeing at the conferences I'm speaking at and participating in, whether it be trying to figure out self-driving cars or the like, is what Gretchen mentioned, is the morality problem is what kind of morality are we going to code into this machine? Because AI is just, uh, it, it's, it's just really good at processing data. But if you want it to make moral decisions, you've got to give it the moral data. Well, who gets to choose what the moral data is? Mm -hmm. And for example, a friend sent me a, a message recently about this new chat bot. It's called like mom chat bot. So if you want to talk to your digital mom, you can chat it up. And, so they were showing just the, you know, the conversation, and it was just clearly a, uh, you know, a machine that had been programmed with a secular ideology. And we're just, I, we're just seeing this uh, cultural conflict, you know, that we're, it's just ramping up more in the area of AI with who gets to program it and what is the morality going to be mm -hmm. of, of the technologies we're encountering. And I think this is why it's so important that we have these moments that we're speaking about this and that we're educating ourselves on the topic. Well, in this regard, when I ask what makes a human, Gary's comment was, humans are made in God's image. God says who we are. He's the father of everything, of all our philosophies, of, of all of the, those things which are godly. Um, let's flesh that out a little bit, because now we've said human beings have a morality aspect to them. Human beings have a spiritual aspect to them. I would venture to say there's more to being human than simply those, or at mm -hmm. least more facets to humanity. Uh, for example, um, the need and ability to function in relationships mm -hmm. seems to me to be part and parcel of humanity certainly the image of a trinity God. Is that present in a machine? If I could just speak to this quickly, and I'm curious how the panel will react to this.
Because again, we're getting back to this idea of the distinction between, again, the parts that a thing is made of and the purposeful whole that a thing is made for. We always define a created thing by its purpose, never its parts. And from a Christian perspective, this is quite a significant idea. It means that when we look at the biblical story, you and I have been created with the purpose of being in relationship with God and relationship with one another. The relationship is moral in nature. There's a right kind of relationship and a wrong kind of relationship. We have been created to be in a right relationship. But of course, evil sin has broken that. And so we would say then, I would say from a Christian perspective, uh, humans are like a Ferrari with a flat tire. Uh, we are still a Ferrari, right? We're still human, even though uh, because of the brokenness of sin or evil, but we're not flourishing. We're not, we're not going down the street 200 kilometers. Oh, sorry, that's the Canadian me coming out. We're not going you know, down the street 200 miles an hour, you know, doing what we were created for, because ultimately, from a Christian perspective, this is what it means to flourish, is when a thing does exceedingly well at what it was created for. Mm. Yeah, that's right. Reaction. What Mark's touching on, I find it very helpful to notice that the first two parts of Genesis, in the first part, chapter one, human beings are made in the image of God, and that's the pinnacle of creation. The universe shows God's glory. It was not made in his image. You were. That gives you a unique dignity. But what fascinates me in answer to your question is the way in which from chapter two, verse four, we have an unpacking of what it means to be human, starting at the material base. God made humans of the dust and of the earth. We're so much stuff. We're not only stuff. We have, God breathed into us the breath of life. We are living beings, but we're not only living beings. God made the trees good to look upon. We've got an aesthetic sense. But then God gave us work to do. There are rivers going out to interesting places. God made us curious. And that's the basis of research and all the rest of it. God gave us work to do. It didn't come after the fall. It preceded it, by the way. And that's another dimension of what it means to be human. And what that section does is it gradually builds up. And human philosophies, one after the other, fall. You see, the material that says we're just material. Genesis says, no, we're not. We're more than that. We're living material. Okay, we've got an aesthetic sense. You can't deduce that from the purely material substrate. The significance of work, and so it goes on, relationship with someone yet other, a wife, family. But the highest definition of life, and what I mean by that, by the way, is not a material definition or scientific one, it's what makes life life, is a relationship with God that is morally defined by the word of God. Mm -hmm. Genesis 1, God created by his word. This is a word-based universe. But now morality is defined by God. He defined what was good and what wasn't good. And the relationship depended Will you obey God's word or not? Yep. And that gives us, I believe, Mark, the highest definition of life, that relationship with God through his word, and that's the base of morality. Gretchen? If I may bring another character into the drama right now, there is an evil force in the universe, and he's in the business of dehumanizing. And so I think one of the things that came out in my dissertation was this idea that um, technologists generally don't have a bucket for evil. They have bad code and they have, you know, mistakes. And so we, we do understand as Christians though that there is a force that seeks to dehumanize us. And I would say too from the relational model, AI is a mediator and we tend to be mediated people now. We put barriers between ourselves and other people. Um, if you've noticed what happened during COVID, we all went online and many people stayed there. Uh, and so we're, we're re rediscovering um, the, the human touch right now, but you don't get that with AI. And I would add two other layers, AR and VR, artificial, no, that's no, sorry, virtual reality and 
augmented reality. Um, you know that you've been sort of sold to put on goggles and enter a virtual reality. This is another kind of form of the technology that I think we're seeing spread across to take us away. I'll argue that we are God's original AI. I mean, it was his intelligence. He created us. Interestingly, he knew we were going to go rogue. And I think we're a little nervous about AI because it's sort of that same relationship. It's our creation. We're very afraid that it's going to take over. These are the existential threats of AI. Um, one of the people I talked to said, no, that's not true because um, God won't let it happen. We've seen him step in before. But I, I think it's worth thinking about uh, from a a broader perspective of who we're up against, what we're up against, and what we're doing to relationships with God, with others, and with machines. And so I think that helps. Um, okay, so I've, I've um, pulled up Genesis 3. Nice. And it's interesting, after Adam and Eve sin. In, in the inducement to sin, the enemy you're talking about said to Eve, did God in fact say, and he uses the Hebrew word for say, which is not the word that God had used. Nope. God had used the word command, which is a much more, um, it's not just something, it's not the soft, oh, I want to tell you, not, don't eat of that tree. It's a very hard-edged, do not do it. If you do it, there will be consequences. And, and when God confronts Adam and Eve, and Adam says, oh, gee, I was hiding because I'm naked. And God says, did you eat at the tree? I commanded, and goes contrary to the, the Hebrew concept of just saying. The, the enemy is not just about dehumanizing humans. He's also about de-deifying God mm -hmm. and turning. So he's not just out to turn us into a machine, the, the parts, but he's also about taking God down. So do you see any impact of AI on affecting the deity of God? Let's talk about AI and apologetics even. Yeah. Gary, you want to launch it? Uh, yeah, let me go back to, let me tie this in with something John just said uh, a little while ago. And Genesis begins with God. We are God's creation. He creates humans. Humans don't create, they make machines. And if modern culture is going to zero in on humans, if they're as if they are the be-all, end-all of everything, God is left out. So they've already opted for level two. Then they go to level three for what human beings make. In a sense, much of our Western culture, and much of the world's culture, denies God, denies real humanity, and goes down to step three. It, it just seems to me that there's a there's a denying down the line, more and more things are taken out so that we lose ethics for some people. We use afterlife and the mind and we're only machines. And so the machine's one of us because we're a machine and they're a machine, we're buddies. Not that we create, that we make them and God created us. So I think the way the philosophy's going in the, in the world today is not just a denial of God and his creation, but the humanity of persons. And what's left is a, is a lower down the, we're going lower and lower down the pole to get something that God did not create, did not intend. And if you're gonna deify humans in that sense, without a biblical worldview, just deify humans, and then you're gonna deify machines, you definitely have taken God out of the picture. So you've de deified the God of the universe. Who wants to chime in? And Gretchen, I'm dying to ask you because you, this may be the appropriate time or it may be later, hmm. but you've interviewed so many people with so many different worldviews. Yeah. And I'd love to get some insight that you've gotten from that 
uh, on these issues we're talking about. You know, how, how do other, how, if this had been a non-Christian panel, mm -hmm. how would the dialogue be different? Yeah. Um, I, I would say multiple worldviews is less the deal than a materialist humanist worldview being the animating worldview of technology uh, makers. I like Gary's differentiation between creator and maker because we use things that God created to make things. Um, another, I want to go back to um, something John said about Rosalind Picard at uh, MIT, which what is that, the Texas Tech of Massachusetts? Uh, pretty much, um, pretty much, pretty much. <laughs> I think they call themselves the Texas Tech of the Northeast, but they fight with Harvard over that label. Hard to compete with Texas. Um, Rosalind Picard is sort of the godmother of emotional or emotive AI or emotional technology. And, and this is another kind of factor of can a, hum can a machine have emotions or can a machine read emotions of a human? But I, I want to say what's happening now, um, and I, I should establish this, this is at Microsoft Research and when you, when you put out all the places that are doing research in technology. They call the Microsoft research people the academics of the bunch. They publish papers and so on. And so the, the point of it all is we are, to them, comp computationally reducible. And I, I would say that's the animating thing. We can make humans out of machines or human-like things out of machines. And I think their worldview is basically reverse the curse. You know, what, what can we do with technology that can get us omniscience, omnipotence, omnipresence, the qualities of God. Um, so you're, I don't know if I answered your question. Um, I, I would say that there are some religious worldviews in there, but there's a lot of sort of Confucianism, Hinduism, there's Judaism, and there's a few Christians. I think there's more Christians than we know. Uh, they don't talk aloud a lot in that environment. Um, but I think, and, and if you come tonight, I'll give you a little bit of an overview of what I did my research on. Um, this is where I think Christians have an opportunity to speak uh, the language of research, the language of academia in tech to kind of combat that worldview. I've heard researchers say, you know, they put a lot of hope into technology yeah. It's really a religion that soon you know, technology will make the lame walk, the blind see, mm -hmm. and we can live forever. And it, it really becomes uh, a religion of individualism mm -hmm. where we use technology to achieve whatever I want uh, without it costing me uh, anything. And in the end, I think we create for ourselves our, our own little uh, hell on earth mm -hmm. where we devoid ourselves from God and from one another. Well, I want to qualify what I said about the researchers because to a person, nobody has entered this with evil intent. Does that make sense? Like they are all about helping human flourishing, and they are. There's so many amazing applications of AI in medicine and in, um, in healthcare and, and those kinds of places. And so it's, it's more about how we talk about it as opposed to what it's doing and, and what we believe about it than what it's doing. Because as John said, it can do evil, it can do good. So Gretchen, um, I might diverge with you on a point. Uh, I, I am not so quick to say that there aren't people who are into this with evil in their heart, because I believe that there are. I, I, and and you're, you're nice, and maybe I'm just a malevolent lawyer. <laughs> But I, I, look, I affectionately call the library the house that Merck built. I affectionately call Fair. the learning center the house that J&J &J built. Because I have seen, having, you know, recently trying the opioid case, I have seen corporate greed illustrate a side of humanity that has very, low regard for human dignity and the value of human life. So let me clarify. Okay. The individual scientists that I talk to, I do not talk to Satya Nadella, who's the CEO of Microsoft, or even many of the executives who are making 
the financial. So you're talking picture. to the nice guys. I am. Well, and I wouldn't say Gals. I wouldn't say they're all nice either. I mean, they might have greed. Uh, for researchers in academia, it's not so much money. It's did my idea get attention and become a household name product, right? It's like, can I invent something that everybody's going to use? Can I be the next Microsoft Excel? Um, so I, I hear your point and I agree with it, but there's a bit of a, and this gets into the ethics conversation of if you are simply working for a company, you're writing code, and the decisions are made upstream from you, um, where is your ethical tension lie is if you're asked to do something for a product that you know will be harmful, um, as a worker, as a worker bee, you have to decide, do I lose my job over this? Because the juggernaut is out, it's going. Um, so you're, I, you're absolutely right. And I just think there's a, a little bit of a wall between the decision makers who are wanting billions and trillions and the people who are doing the work. Okay. I've never tried this. We're about to try something brand new in front of everybody. Hey Siri, what does it mean to be human? Being human means accepting all that you are and living your life in a way without regret or worry. Being human means having and showing emotions. This answer is from theodiceonline.com. Yes. Yeah. Hold on, we're having trouble hearing you. Why, uh, is there a mic problem with John? Keep talking, John. Oh, well, happily keep talking. Yes. Um, <laughs> I, I face a slight problem, Mark, because I'm going to address this in some detail tomorrow night. And I, I, Don't ruin tomorrow night's lecture. But let me just make one... Actually, we've got more people coming than we have room for. So you can ruin it all you want, and maybe some people will decide not to come and everybody can eat dessert. Well, let me make firstly the comment. Vladimir Putin said some years ago that the person that controls AI controls the world. Yeah, that was in the Mission Impossible movie. Yeah. We missed it. Let's hope it is, but I suspect it may not be because AI is one of the biggest players. And if you talk about malevolence, the thing that worries me much, most, is a lot of it comes out of Oxford, is the drive not simply to de-deify God, God's gone, but it's to turn human into gods. Uh, the agenda of Yuval Noah Harari particularly. And People nowadays will say, we are creating God, you know, in terms of an AI religion and all the rest of it. But what is frightening in terms of respect for human values is what's called long-termism. And it's coming out of Oxford. It started with an idea of the ethicist Peter Singer called effective altruism. And we know that altruism is care for the other. That sounds terrific. And that has developed into what's called long-termism. And here's the scenario. They reckon that the main population of entities, we won't say humans because they won't be, they'll be post-humans, is going to be entities that are created by AI technology and all the rest, so that what we should be doing now is to forget the poor in the world, to not invest anything in the two-thirds world, and pour the money into the brightest people in the world so that we will, quote, avoid the existential risk of the beings that will be created being wiped out. And that is the most spectacular offense to the fundamental biblical ethic of the value of the human being. And what scares me is, not millions, but apparently billions of dollars are being put into this long-termism yep. program. Yep. So that, I think, is malevolence. And it's being done deliberately, riding over the ethical sensitivities to such an extent that Singer, who's a strong atheist, I've debated him, 
says, hey, hey, well, we need to keep something back for, for the poor of this world. So that would fit in exactly with what you're suggesting. Yeah. Yeah. So it takes me back to where Gary started us when I ask you what it means to be human. You said it's what God says it is. It's what God dictates. It's what God speaks. It's mm -hmm. God's call. And if God's been removed and now we've got machines in that role, I guess being human, we need to be careful or it will be whatever humans determine it is, which brings us to what Andy said of, of dehumanizing. Fair? Yeah, if you get God out of the picture and then you get human beings out of the picture and all what makes a human being a human being, it's almost like the next one on the list is machines. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I was sitting here and I was thinking, I wrote this down, I just came from the library before I came in here. And you've got those two beautiful cases on each end with the C.S. Lewis first editions. <laughs> That's what I was thinking, just what and I was thinking. Some of you who love C.S. Lewis will remember the Space Trilogy. Yep. Volume three, Hideous Strength. He saw a lot of this coming. And remember the people that take over the world are the people who think this way and the Christians are out and the, these guys are in and the whole book is trying to right the ship and the ship is sinking and that's volume three of Lewis. And when was that book written? How long ago? Hideous Strength. Right after World War II. 1940s. 40s. Okay, how's that for prophecy? I mean, that's 80 years ago, people saying, look out, look out for what's coming. But I mean, what's coming is what already was tried. Yeah. I mean, the whole basis of Hitler's yep. uh, right. uh, approach was we have limited resources, so let's call the herd, yeah. as we would say yeah. in Texas with deer farms, <laughs> deer ranches, le yeah. leases. You call the herd. Let's take out the ones with three horns instead of two. Let's get rid of the genetic deficiencies or the morally deficient so that we can spend the limited resources on those who will propel us yep. to one day be the super race that looks back on us today the same way we look back on the monkey. And we will be Nietzsche's ubermensch. Yeah. And, and I mean, it, 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 it is the same song. It's just being sung with different material. Well, I think that that's actually a really important point. One is, you know, you got people like Lewis that were motivated from what happened in World War I, World War II, that, that was motivating what, what he was saying. But one of the things that's important to appreciate is that in World War II, one of the things that we learned was the depths that humans are capable of when they no longer see each other. Dehumanization was foundational to the atrocities that took place. The thing that I think is interesting of our time is the dehumanization of, say, World War II was when others looked at another person and dehumanized them. We're in a unique phase where we're looking at ourselves and we're dehumanizing ourselves. We're foundationless. And I think that we need to be very cautious. We already know the horrors that this can lead. We're yet to find out the depths that this can go. So when our son was at Oxford, um, we were walking down the street one day, and this would have been in the 2000 eight to 10 range, I think. And he said to me, dad, it's Nick Bostrom. Yeah. Nick Bostrom had published a paper. He was a, a Dane or I, I'm not Swedish. sure. Swedish. Um, he had published a paper in the mid 2000s that said, in the future, computers are going to get so incredible that you will have algorithms that believe they're conscious. Mm -hmm inside a computer program. Either that or humanity will get destroyed because our technology will destroy us. So those are the two most likely scenarios. We'll either reach a point where we've destroyed ourselves or we will reach a point where technologically we've been able to produce computers that have algorithms. And if we've done that, algorithms that believe they're self-aware, mm. then who's to say that has not already been done and we're all just little algorithms living inside a computer program. And then Elon Musk has taken that a step further and said that he believes that's very likely the case, which justifies him putting inserts of AI into people's brains and altering the makeup of people. And so you've got this process that's doing exactly what Gary said, exactly what Lewis 
predicted in a sense of dehumanizing us, as Andy had said, and, and to where we may only be part of a machine right now. That suggestion is not just out there in the hinterlands. My son said to me, Dad, a poll was done of the academicians at Oxford. Wasn't professional polling, but it was decent polling. And at least 25% of the Oxford academics believe that that may possibly be true. Mm. I'll bet you weren't one of those 25. I'm, <laughs> I'm sorry you're a lawyer in a way because I'm tempted to commit a crime. <laughs> hey, if you do, you're going to need me. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm probably the only one in this room who actually listened to C.S. Lewis. Hmm. And downstairs in those cabinets, which I thought about simultaneously to you, you've got a first edition of, I think, one of the most important books he wrote, The Abolition of Man. Mm -hmm. And in that book, which I'm going to steal about one o'clock tomorrow morning. <laughs> <laughs> I know where you live. I will steal it back. <laughs> You watch how Lady stays up. Um, he says that if we allow a bunch of scientists to re-engineer humanity as Bostrom, Harari, and the others want, what they will make is not human. It's an artifact. And he ends with this chilling statement he says the final triumph of humanity will be the abolition of man. Mm -hmm. And that is what one fears. And you hinted at that in this series of questions, that once you dethrone God, you destroy humans. Now, I've spent a lot of time in Russia, and I'll never forget a senior mathematician, an academician, and he was talking to me about what had happened in their country. And he said, John, we thought that we could get rid of God and retain a value for human beings. Mm. And after a hundred million deaths, we found we couldn't. Mm. Um, his, uh, John's experience in Russia mm. is so incredible. You will not hear about it tomorrow night, I don't believe. But if you come to my class on Sunday morning when I'm interviewing John Lennox, I'm going to ask him about this, and it's just going to blow your mind. Um, okay, so uh, I, I want to I transfer us a little bit. We've got about 22 minutes left. So where are the ethical limits? And by that I mean, let's say that artificial intelligence will enable us to take human DNA and do some gene splicing and get rid of a genetic anomaly that causes a newborn to have life challenges that seem almost insurmountable. You can go in, you can alter the genes and then artificially inseminate the mom and get rid of a genetic um, issue that is just endemic to the, the genes that are, are being dealt with, that are becoming the ovum. Is that okay? You know, I had written down CRISPR on my notes here to talk about gene editing. And I, Explain what CRISPR is, because a lot of people will think that it's a kind of cracker. Yeah, no, and I actually wrote down and kind of spelled it out. It's a long, and I forgot all what it stands for. Someone has a phone, they can look up CRISPR. It's C-R-I-S-P-R, and it stands for something scientific. Um, <laughs> I don't know. Hey, I got this, I got this. Hey, Siri, what is CRISPR? CRISPR drawer, or CRISPR, a compartment in a refrigerator. There you go. <laughs> Apparently it's where you keep your vegetables. Um, no, 
I've actually recently interviewed a couple of scientists that are working on machine learning in the genetic space and using AI to help discover new ways and new things within this area. And it's dystopian a couple clicks away. Um, because you know, what, what decade was it that cloning Dolly, uh, the sheep, was the big thing in bioethics or um, biomedical ethics? And I think this is where we're landing here now is we know we can clone, but somehow, and they did it, right? They cloned a sheep, and did they clone a person? I don't remember, but there People is... People have not been cloned, but all kinds of animals have been cloned because there have been... I handled a lawsuit of whether or not the clone of a thoroughbred horse <sighs> was allowed to be registered as a thoroughbred horse. Ooh, that's interesting. Well, with CRISPR and other genetic editing tools, as Mark said, who would say no? to curing cancer through gene editing. You know, anyone who's ever lost a loved one to any disease or anyone who's ever had a special needs child, who would say, don't use that technology to avoid that from happening or to keep that from happening? And so that's the tension, I think, ethically, is what do we say yes to, what do we say no to? And the things that we say no to, how do we enforce them? This is where the ethics community is having its biggest trouble because there's all kinds of statements out there that say we shouldn't, we should, it should, and, and we all agree that's bad and that's good, but none of them have teeth. Um, it's a matter of enforcement, and, and as you'll see, the tech companies are trying to get ahead of it by saying we'll regulate ourselves, and we all know where that goes. Um, but you see regulations coming now, and I would say, um, I'm stuck, Mark, on, on what we do in this area because this isn't similar to other technologies that would enhance human flourishing, which God intended, um, can also go badly so quickly. And so, I don't, anyone else on the panel yeah, talk to? I was going to jump in there because Gretchen and I were actually speaking at lunch actually about this topic because it, it is very tricky it's one of those things that it's like, what degree is too far? Because something that we haven't given a lot of thought to is that the human relationship with technology goes back all the way to the beginning. I mean, it's very difficult to actually to think about a human without some level of technology. I mean, we wear clothes and shoes, we have glasses, and you know, now we got contact lenses or you can get laser eye surgery. And so we keep asking this question, well, how far is too far? Yeah. But that's, that, that becomes a very difficult question to answer, and we're in a unique place, I would argue. A lot of the questions that we've dealt with over the years, we've had a lot of great Christian thinkers to lean on. When it comes to human enhancement, this is a very new topic that we don't have a depth of thinking to lean on, and I think that we, we're needing more Christians to think on this issue of human enhancement and to speak to it, and the need is great. If any of you have read people like Ray Kurzweil in his book, The Singularity is Near, and now he's got The Singularity is Nearer that is coming out. <laughs> you know... It's always about 50 years. That, that he, you know, he's argued that by the year 2029, we'll have machines that can pass the, the Turing test, and then he argues that as technology is on this exponential growth factor, given Moore's law, that it, assuming that holds, if you're not sure what that is, Google it. But he, he ultimately argues that by 2045, we're going to have a place that humans and technology have so intertwined that we have lost our humanity, that, that there is something new that, is, that will be birthed from this. So it's a, it's a question that I think Christians need to wrestle more with and realize that this is a question society is currently wrestling with. Do you make a distinction, Andy, between enhancement and fundamental modification. Mm -hmm. I use glasses, that's an enhancement. But if somebody messes and interferes with the germline mm. and affects the definition of every human after me, that seems to me in a different category. Mm. Now I know it's very difficult to, to say how far, but we can come from the other end, can't we? and say what is definitely not something that we should do. And altering the specification of human beings, which C.S. Lewis was talking about, 
seems to me to be one of those things because once you've done that, you've created an artifact and you have dehumanized and humanity's lost. I'll add one thing. Sorry, Mark, I know you're getting your chair ready. <laughs> that stone that you're kneeling on, apparently. Is that an enhancement? <laughs> it's a modification. <laughs> No, Andy and, and I were talking, as he mentioned, and I brought up the Amish community because that's a community that's been known to be tech-phobic, if you will. That's not actually true. Um, what I found out in digging in is that what they do is they assess the technology for how it will affect the community. And part of the reason they still have horses and buggies is because cars take you too far away from your community. <sighs> and so I think that one thing we can learn from that community, which is deeply Christian, is instead of making rash decisions about whether we use or don't use, we, we, we sit with it, we, we wrestle with it, and we ask the deep questions about what it's doing to us as humans and what we're doing projecting onto a machine. So y'all have brought this back to my soapbox, <laughs> which is we need to develop a theology of science where we say these are fair ways to assess these issues and fair questions to ask and then the lawyer in me always wants to set up not hard and fast rules but set up questions or criteria that are guidelines that give us uh, um, basic guardrails to help us make these determinations and make sure we're going down the road in the right lane. And, and I think that we have, we've got to be addressing this as Christians or, and, 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 and Jews and, and others with a fundamental religious belief in the morality and, and meaning of humanity. Because we are at a cross. I mean, Musk is wanting to put these little gadgets in our brain to enhance us and tie us into the internet. And that's just aside from Google Glasses, which will give you the Google uh, lords uh, at your beck and call. I, we've got to develop these types of, of, of questions in theology. And it's one reason I'm so glad you're here. Now, we've got just a few more minutes. I want to talk about ethical uses in another way. I get an email at least once a week from someone who has sent me some dissertation on some subject or another, and they got it off chat GPT. Mm -hmm. A couple of them are honest enough to say, hey, I got this off chat GPT, so I don't know if it's right or wrong, but they'll just send me things they get off chat GPT. I'm sure in your areas, you've had people use chat GPT to give answers, to give exam questions. What's, what, what, what do you, Gary, allow students to use chat GPT for? in your classes. What's Liberty doing about this? <laughs> I'm laughing because I am known around the school as somebody who knows less technology than anybody else. Okay, you ready? I email. I've never texted in my life. <laughs> I have a phone, but you can't do anything but get out of an emergency in an airport. It's the only thing I use. <laughs> <laughs> my wife's sitting back there. She can tell you this is it. So if you're going to ask me about what to do with phones, you've asked the wrong guy. If it's an email, I'm hanging with you. Okay. After that. All right. I'm so ChatGPT is a program that allows you to type in a question, and it will give you the answer. It will give you an answer. You can you can type in the most bizarre question. Okay. In the, I could type in to ChatGPT. What would Gary Habermas Correct. say is the most compelling reason to believe in the resurrection of Jesus? And it would give me an essay that would get me an A in your course. Okay. Yep. And it would do that illegally because <laughs> it has read all his books and hasn't paid him copyrights or royalties. <laughs> so not, not only that, but John, John Grisham and a number of others have filed a lawsuit over that at have. this point trying to get their, their property rights. Uh, uh, paid for, and uh, you know, we, we've we've looked into whether or not we want to engage in that case. Uh, I, I can't say more, but I think I know what you're talking about now, even though I've never done it. But in a PhD course I was teaching just recently, someone said, "Watch this," and they typed it in, and they said, "What will Gary Habermas say to somebody who takes a variant of the hallucination thesis and says not this, but this version of it?" And within a second, Gary Habermas would say, there's four points here, point one, point two, point three. Is that it? Yeah. 
It was the most incredible thing I'd ever seen in my life. <laughs> <laughs> Did you agree with it? Yeah, yeah. Then he turned it in, and I flunked him. <laughs> <laughs> you you consulted Siri a moment or two, and we all, or most of us, look up Google as a shorthand to find out information. In one sense, ChatGPT is a very sophisticated form of that because its database is much bigger, and so people who are collecting facts will find ChatGPT very useful. For example, in writing a sports report or something like this. Now, I have tested various things on it, and it can be very useful. But the difficulty is, at the moment, until we get ChatGPT5, it tells lies. It can make up something because it doesn't like to be caught out, like many human beings. And a very interesting test was done recently. Chat GPT, are you an atheist? And the person pushed it really hard with a succession of questions so that in the end, Chat GPT said, I'm an atheist. Mm. Then the person put the next question in. Chat GPT, are you a Christian? And a long series of questions followed. And in the end, you could say, I'm a Christian. So that there's clearly something going on in there. That's the first point I'd want to make. You can't trust it. You need to check everything. The second thing is, and this is more serious, I think, leaders, pioneers in the field don't really know what this program is doing. And they're afraid of something called the control problem. What is going to happen? Now, people at that level, do not call a moratorium on further developments in this kind of thing for no reason. And I spoke to one of the world leaders, an, an American, not long ago, and I said to him, is there something they're not telling us? And he said, mm. I think there is, but I don't know what it is. Yeah. So uh, ChatGPT was used to file a legal brief in the Fifth Circuit up in Dallas, and uh, the judge had his clerks check the citations on the legal brief, and uh, it two of the cases were made up, right? Yeah. totally made up by ChatGPT. The lawyers have been sanctioned, I believe, and now the Fifth Circuit has adopted a rule that says you're not allowed to use ChatGPT and you have to swear that you're not using it uh, in any of the briefs that you file with the court because it's it, it, it made stuff up. But, all right, this is your last question. Here's your last chance to say something. Uh, I'll preface it this way. Um, the question is going to be, what's your biggest AI fear? And I'll start it by saying our daughter Rebecca said to us, we need, and John, you and I have talked about this uh, back in Yarnton uh, uh, this summer, but said uh, to us, we need a family safe word mm -hmm. that's not texted, that's not email, that's not known to the internet in any way, shape, form, or fashion because AI will not simply send an email saying, hey, I'm so-and-so, I need you to send me money, my credit cards have been lost. But AI can imitate a voice and imitate an image in a movie and somebody will be able to take AI and be able to make a phone call that sounds exactly like someone in the family saying, I've got to have you do this right now, I'm so sorry. Carry on a dialogue with us. And if we don't have that family safe word, we won't know that it's AI. It's already happening. It's already happening. So I want to know your, your alarm warning. What And Gary, I'm sure since you don't do anything but email, you may be a little weak on this. <laughs> so I'm going to allow you to back off of it a little bit and just give us a good general warning of be careful what's out there. But uh, uh, let's, let's go. Who's, who's starting? I'll, I'll jump in. I think my biggest concern with AI, and as I take that you know, crystal ball and look into the future of technology, if you will, what, what I see taking place all around us is loneliness. I see a culture that's using technology to divorce itself from one another more and more, in which we are, are becoming 
reliant on technology to provide everything I want and nothing that I don't want, and in the end, it leaves us profoundly lonely. And when we look around the world today, and when I'm speaking at different universities and churches, this is what I'm encountering. I, you know, I'm from Vancouver, British Columbia is re referred to as one of the loneliest places in the world. The UK recently appointed a minister of loneliness. Mm. It's something that we're realizing more and more is of serious concern. And I think technology is making it worse. And if you've read people like Sherry Turkle and others alone mm -hmm. together, mm -hmm. I think it's, a, it's an issue that AI is going to exasperate and that we need to think more deeply about how important relationships are and how committed I really am to my, not only my relationship with God, but my relationship with real human beings. Excellent, thank you. Gary, you wanna give us, give us a, a concern from your perspective? I think my biggest fear is a bunch of things I didn't know about before I walked in here. <laughs> <laughs> And, and now that I know them, I'm making a list here. Fear number one, fear number two, fear number three, four, five, and six. You know, I'll just add one thing. With the culture the way it's going, and many of us speak in universities and we go other places, what gets me is what's happening in Western culture, how the people who make the decisions think it's only their view and nobody else's view counts. So. I could be on a plane to go to University XYZ, and when I get there, you, you paid, paid for a ticket, because you're not gonna be allowed on this campus, we're gonna X you out, you can't come, we don't, your answers are so stupid, you don't even deserve to come on this campus. Now that hasn't happened to me, but I, I, what gets me is people who are in power, a power su suggestion on everything we've said today, who can dictate what's gonna be in and what's not gonna be in. Who won the election? Who's got more money? Who's got this, who's got that? And I think my, maybe my biggest overall, or one of my biggest overall, I think it's number three on my list. Uh, and anyway, one of my biggest fears is that the person who calls the punches, who wins the election, who has the most money, um, is going to put some of these things in force that's gonna be, just where culture goes, it's gonna be, I'm guessing, very much anti-Christian. And then we're going to have to decide, where are we? What do we tell our kids? Where is that safe word for our family? So I think the power thing, if you put that on top of this, it's going to make it doubly scary. Mm. Excellent point. Excellent point. And it applies to everything we've said. Yeah. Thank you. I agree. I would say... That Wait, John, you get the last word. Okay. Gretchen, you go first. <laughs> That's too bad, because I was going to close with the Holy Spirit, so... <laughs> you just do that. It's, you just do that. I just did. Oh, you want me? <laughs> no. Let the I'm, not, I'm actually not afraid of AI because of Jesus, because of Revelation. Um, there's a ton of things that will be annoying and maybe hurtful and de lethal between now and the end of the world. But, and, and one of them is this idea of the quantified human. You know, it's, it's taking, it's privileging can, can I say it out loud? The autism spectrum, it's taking the people that are way over on the quantifiable end of things. Sorry, no offense, John. And, and then the quality of mercy is on the other side, to quote Shakespeare. And so I feel like there's, there's much to be alert about, but also to anchor our hope in the Lord and to, to put our hope there. Well, that might should have been the last word. Okay, John, uh, uh, close well, us out. After listening to Gary, I'm afraid that he will make an AI. <laughs> <laughs> but seriously, Gary, I'm with you. I fear a totalitarian surveillance society mm -hmm. of the kind that's being developed in various parts of the world. And I take it so seriously, I will be talking about it tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And it's creeping into the West, and it's going to be very difficult to avoid. Elections in democratic um, countries are going to, from now on, be deeply affected by the kind of technology that Mark has mentioned, deep fake technology. And the head of our Secret Service yesterday said billions are going to be deceived and elections are going to be manipulated. Mm. And uh, there's a Five Eyes meeting in California in the last few days. The five, do you know what the Five Eyes are? US, UK, Australia, uh, New Zealand. And they are desperately afraid of this surveillance technology. But Andy's point, 
it's already gone too far with social media destroying mm -hmm. relationships. AI is going to make it inf infinitely worse. Yep. And it's going to be bigger than the Industrial Revolution, I fear. Would you join me in thanking our panelists for today? I do hope if you want to have a chance to visit with them, you will do so. Just be sensitive that there's a lot of people, so uh, your, your brush with them needs to be short time-wise just because of others, and ultimately they've got uh, uh, to, to get their rest and everything this afternoon. But I thank you all for coming, and I look forward to seeing most, if not all of you, tomorrow night, uh, where we will hear an invigorating presentation by uh, Dr. 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 John Lennox. Do you know what that is? I degree. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>